And uh, so geostatistics is a kind of a obscure um, uh, field of science. Uh, let me find the full screen. Uh, this way. Uh, so um, the uh, the slides I will present are not even my slides. They're the slides of my uh, previous uh, PhD advisor, Hans van Nagel from uh, Ecole des Mines. And um, uh, the, um, the point of, uh, say, geostatistics is um, um, that if you have a data simulation system, and in the extreme case where you, your model is so bad that you, you don't even, um, you can't even trust it, the observation, the uh, model errors are so big, what you obtain in the end is geostatistics, is simple um, interpolation of the observations, but it could be advanced interpolations with error estimates. So that's uh, the, the point of my course today, geostatistics. So the outline will be uh, going four points. First one is uh, exploring the data with a tool called the, the variogram. Then interpolating data, the tool called the creeding. Then we go quickly through nonlinear aspects of geostatistics, so how to change the support or the representativeness of the observations. I always say support because it's easier to pronounce, but um, uh, it's also known as representativeness. And uh, the uh, the case of the uh, Gaussian anamorphosis or so, uh, transformation to Gaussian, which is uh, see, uh, somewhat linked to the change of support. And then, uh, and before, simulating data. So it's about random simulations and how to generate an ensemble of geostatistical simulations. And that uh, is linking to the ensemble kind of filter. And uh, I will show you why. But before that, um, I will. Um, I will uh, show you a little warning. Um, so, um, am I sharing uh, the uh, still the, the preview, the, the, the PDF, or am I sharing the PowerPoint uh, file now? Do you see uh, something called warning notations, or still the same outline as before? Outline, please. Outline, yeah. Stop sharing and share again. So um, this is a warning here that uh, it's, uh, you may find the same uh, concepts with different notations in different textbooks. And uh, so one example of that is uh, so how people note variables, observations, and a cost function. And uh, I have a little summary here. Uh, so um, in geostatistics, you will find, um, say, a random variable called Z, capital Z, because it's random. An observation, uh, so uh, a scalar is a small z with an alpha to number it. And a cost function uh, is, uh, is always noted phi. Uh, then uh, in, the, uh, in the book from Guy Evansen, the variable will be uh, psi, observation D, and a cost function J. In machine learning, which we'll, uh, we'll see maybe uh, tomorrow, that will be the notation that uh, uh, Julien will present, and that's uh, say the uh, the the more uh, widespread notation of the uh, ID et al. paper ninety seven. X is the variable, the unknown. The observation is y, and the cost function is j as well. But they all mean the same, and uh, you will notice that the covariance function or the covariance matrix is p in uh, Gare's um, presentation. It is c in geostatistics, and I, I don't know what it is in uh, machine learning, but um, so uh, don't uh, yeah, don't be puzzled. That's just uh, the way things uh, uh, things happen. Um, stop sharing. I'm sharing now the PDF. And so now um, I'll stop this course on uh, the, uh, geostatistics by showing two time series. And um, so uh, the top time series and the bottom time series are random processes in one dimension. And uh, one of them is, um, is a red noise, or maybe both of them are red noises. And uh, if, you, uh, if you like to play the game, uh, you can type in the chat top if, the top, if you think the top series is red noise, bottom if the bottom series is red noise, or both 
if you think both series are red noise? I can give you a few seconds to, uh, to type your answers. Actually, uh, I don't see the answers uh, as a presenter. Um, yeah, there's one answer coming. Okay. So far, there's a, yeah, there's a fair mix of answers. Top, bottom, bottom, both. So I will uh, now, well, um, the answer is that only the top series is red noise. And um, the bottom series is actually a random walk, which is a sum of red noise. So the, the bottom series is actually the sum of the top series. And, um, and the, the difference is uh, actually the red, not the red, but uh, the, the dashed line in the middle. Uh, the red noise has an attractor. It's always coming back to zero. Uh, even if it has incursions to the, to the uh, high and low values, it will always come back to the uh, dashed line, which is the, its, uh, its mean. And the bottom series has no mean. You can uh, generate the series forever, and the mean will change forever. So um, the top series is, in uh, geostatistical terms, stationary. Uh, the mean and the variance of the time series make sense because you can take any subset of that and you will have the same mean and same variance. But for the bottom series, you can take a chunk in the beginning or in the end, and you will have a different mean and also maybe a, a different variance. So uh, you can still characterize uh, these, uh, uh, these data uh, by a variogram. So you can calculate something empirical that will uh, tell you something about this, uh, this time series. So the variogram, uh, that's one uh, a bit uh, ugly name. You don't use it in a common language. Um, it is um, the, uh, yeah, the king of the tools in geostatistics. It's the one thing that uh, yeah, they define the, uh, the community of uh, geostatisticians. Um, you have a vector of uh, coordinates of a point. You can take the separation between the points as a vector h. And um, then you have samples values, z, uh, at each pair of points. And you can calculate the, the square differences of these um, pairs of points. So z of the, the last point, the end of the vector minus z of the beginning of the vector squared divided by two. You will understand later why uh, this is divided by two. And that's what you do with a point. But you have uh, several points, hopefully, in your data set. So for each of the points, you can gather in a diagram, h being the separation, and the ordinate is the square difference of the, uh, the values of z between two parallel points, and you obtain a cloud of points. And since the, um, in the most data sets, the more distance you have between the points, the more differences you have in the values, say the, um, the temperature in Bergen and Stavanger are more or less the same, but if you go to France or to China or to the USA, then, or to the Arctic, you find uh, large differences in temperature. So the, the differences increase with the distance. That's uh, a normal things of, uh, of life, I would say. And um, the how the, um, the differences are increasing as a matter of distance is the interesting part for us. So if you want to uh, start doing statistics on, the, uh, on this uh, say cloud of points, you can average them within distance. Later you see you can do that with uh, averaging angles and take classes hk of uh, say equally spaced uh, distances. Then you can uh, average this uh, variogram for each of the classes. You have the, the little histogram here. You see that it increases and it stops increasing after a while. And that has, say, um, a systematic um, behavior that you, as a scientist, have a duty to fit with a theoretical model. So here you find a theoretical model. Uh, you see later what kind of uh, function that can be. And you see, well, it fits quite well. It, um, it starts at a point that is uh, above the, the zero, it increases, and then it saturates. It becomes flat after a while. OK. And the function you obtain here is called gamma. Gamma is the theoretical variogram, the, the one you have fitted as a function of distance on your observations. No model involved so far, no model at all. Um, then, um, in mathematical uh, terms, the variogram is the average of squared increments for a given spacing h. So 
if you fixed your spacing h, what you have done above is take the expectation of differences of the random variable z, capital Z this time, you see, at two different points, square, and divided by two. The properties, if h is equal to zero, your variable value is zero. If you take uh, the, uh, say, twice the same point, you're, you're sure to have a zero. Second property, it is positive because of the square. And it's an even function, because if you take minus h instead of h, you obtain the same value. And the magic about it is the shape near the origin. So if you look at the shape of the variable near the origin, it is, um, it is linked to the smoothness of the phenomenon. So it is the, um, the best thing you can say about how rough or how smooth the, uh, the data is. So if the regionalized variable is smooth, then your gamma at the origin will be continuous and differentiable as well. So it means that if you take the first derivative of uh, gamma at zero, it will have a value. Since uh, gamma is an even function, that value will be zero. If the variable is rough, and uh, then gamma of h is non-differentiable at the origin. It will be, um, yeah, it will have an angle, and therefore this angle, seeing on the negative side, will make it non-differentiable. If the data is speckled, it, if it is non-continuous, then the variable is discontinuous. Its origin, its value, the first value after zero will be non-zero. It will jump from zero to the first epsilon. Okay, that's that's about the magic. Um, then uh, you may want to, you may wonder why bother with a variogram when you already know the covariance function. So the covariance function, uh, which you know is defined as this, uh, it is the expectation of the product of the anomaly to the mean. M is the mean of the uh, of the, the uh, variable z, and uh, z z uh, taken at uh, a different location minus the mean. Uh, so that product is uh, uh, goes into the expectation. I obtain c of h, the covariance as a function of h. The problem with that, uh, so uh, I'll come to the problem later. First, the properties. The covariance function is bounded by the variance. It is uh, increasing. Its maximum value is c of zero, and then it decreases as a function of h. Um, on the contrary, the variogram is increasing and it has no bound. It can increase forever. The, um, the, uh, this uh, say, uh, variance superior to c of h, that's something that you can actually uh, demonstrate mathematically with the expression of the covariance here, if you have the extra time. Uh, so from, if you have a covariance function, you can always construct the, the, the variogram by taking c of zero minus c of h. You flip uh, the covariance function upside down and you have a variogram. But uh, the contrary is not true. So if your variogram is not bounded, it goes to infinity, um, then uh, the, uh, you, cannot, uh, you cannot have a C of, uh, say, uh, you cannot um, construct a covariance uh, reversely because you're taking the difference of two uh, to infinite. And um, so the variogram uh, has a larger class of random variables. The covariance, if I go back to this expression, uh, you need to know m, the mean, and in the case, the bottom case I've showed you before, when there is no mean, then you're in trouble. So, um, uh, so it's uh, yeah, it's um, it's always safer to use a variogram because you can use that on a larger class of of uh, random variables. So, but what is it? The variogram. It's a positive definite function, and uh, that's characterized uh, by this conditionally negative definite function. So that's uh, that's kind of a obscure type of, uh, of um, type of function. So uh, if you take any set of points, the matrix, the variogram matrix, so the matrix of all variogram values between all pairs of points, alpha minus beta, um, respects this inequality here. So you can take any vector value w here multiply it to the left and to the right of the variogram uh, matrix. And what you obtain is a value that is uh, always, a scalar that is always negative or zero for any set of weights, which has zero as a sum. So, well, um, why do we call it conditionally negative? 
The conditionally refers to this condition here, the sum is equal to zero, negative because well, it's negative definite, uh, all the products end up with a negative value. You're more, most, you're more often used to positive definite uh, functions, but this is a uh, conditionally negative definite function for your curiosity. Um, now, these functions that we use to fit the variogram, there's uh, a number of them. Some of them are authorized, some others are not authorized. So I'll run you through uh, a list of authorized covariance models. Uh, the one that was used on the example above is this spherical covariance. It is, um, it's called spherical because uh, that comes from a bit of geometry. If you uh, seed random circles of uh, a random size and random location, the, um, the intersection of the circles will actually follow that kind of a poly, uh, third order polynomial. So um, uh, that's uh, the, uh, say, that's what explains the name. And uh, it is simply, um, so as I said, a polynomial that starts uh, with a, an angle. It's not zero at the origin because of this uh, two, uh, three, uh, three halves uh, here. And it decreases and it saturates. And after it reaches uh, a value A, you continue it with, um, with zeros. So um, this uh, covariance function corresponds to this type of, uh, of realization. So if your field, uh, and if you had all the values, um, it looked like this, then uh, you can calculate the covariance function and you would obtain this, uh, this function. Uh, the right bottom right here is uh, say a black and white value. If you just take all the values above zero and uh, below zero and just um, make them black and white, that's what you obtain. It's a field that is, uh, has obviously some roughness. That's because of the, um, the, uh, the behavior at the origin. And yes, it's, um, you can take values beyond uh, a certain distance and they would not be more different than uh, say what they are within this uh, say uh, characteristic distance, which is the A distance, the limit beyond which all the values of C are zero. So that was one function. Another uh, maybe more famous type of function is the exponential. So why bother with a polynomial when you can do uh, pretty much the same thing with a very simple function, exponential minus h divided by a. So uh, a here can be taken as the same uh, same distance. It doesn't reach zero at a. You see that there's an, as uh, an asymptote. So a is sort of the uh, uh, say uh, roughly the place where the uh, the currents is very small but not zero. And what you obtain is uh, if you we obtain this covariance function if you had fields that looked like this. So they look rough. They look pretty much, um, say, they are, would be hard to distinguish from the uh, spherical covariance function. But if you look at the, um, the zero and the, the white, black and white uh, panels, you see that the, the spherical covariance is a bit more lumped. You see more areas of um, white, areas of white, while the exponential is maybe a bit more, say, diffused uh, this, um, in this way. So. Um, uh, this exponential covariance function is the covariance function, for example, of the red noise we had in the series in the beginning. It's uh, something that is happening if you just uh, let diffusion happen at random. Then uh, we'll go for another exponential, the Gaussian covariance function. So I don't need to present you the Gaussian uh, function here. The difference with the exponential is that it has uh, a zero um, uh, derivative at the origin. And it uh, goes to zero very quickly because of the h square. And uh, the fact that it uh, has zero derivative, derivative of the origin, you remember that's uh, a mark of the smoothness. And you see that you have a field that is indeed smooth. And if you take this, the, the positive and negative values, you see these lumps and they're connected. And that, that's all, uh, say, uh, related to this uh, Gaussian covariance function. It's a bit more than uh, a zero asymptote, uh, say, a zero. Um, it's not a symptom, but a zero derivative at the origin. You can take any derivative, the second, the third, the fourth derivative at the origin, they will all be zero. And that's a case of a function called analytical. It means that if all the derivatives are uh, zero at the origin, you can, it's sufficient to know one point of your field and you have, you have enough knowledge to feel all of it. It's a, it's a very particular uh, type of function. 
then uh, you can take the cardinal sine function. So sine, uh, sine of uh, uh, absolute value of h divided by h. And this is, uh, say, an oscillatory but decreasing function of h. And it will have, uh, say, it will cross zero. So you may have a zero crossing value here. But the a value is much further down the road. It is, say, um, somewhere at the, after the second bump. So this, this covariance is, uh, is kind of particular because um, it is the covariance that uh, has a bit of negative values and then a bit of positive values again. So if you are at a point anywhere in your field and you go some distance in any direction, you'll find yourself, uh, say, initially with uh, values that are positively correlated, that are more like it. And then you are more likely to find the opposite sign of the values. You're, if you start negative at this point here, I don't know if you see my mouse, but um, I have a, a mouse in the, the mouse in the uh, a blue value. Then uh, what you will find around it is mostly positive values. And then if you go another distance further away, you are more likely to find again negative values. So that's uh, oscillatory type of um, of behavior. Is typically uh, what you find in the um, altimeter data in oceanography. So um, when you uh, calculate maps of uh, altimeter values, uh, starting from a, a satellite that only goes along tracks, doesn't cover the whole field, then the function uh, that is used to interpret these fields uh, is, so as a uh, work done at CLS in the 90s, is a cardinal sine covariance function. That's for the, the few oceanographers among you. Right, and then the very, very simplest uh, variogram function is called the nugget effect. It is the variogram of a field that has only noise, no structure. So this is white noise. There's no spatial structure. The variogram is zero at the origin, but zero is the very the only point that is uh, at zero. As soon as you move away by an epsilon, then you find yourself at a value of one. So that's a discontinuous uh, variogram, and it's it is what it is, only a discontinuity at the origin. So now let's construct an empirical variogram. Um, you take the average of square increments for a class of uh, distance. You take the, the, uh, the average of that. That gives you a value. That's an example in trunk set. You, so you have, uh, say, some values uh, along one dimension. And if you calculate, I will spare you the, the calculation, but the difference is between 35 and 35, that's a zero here, plus 35 to 33, that's a two here. You obtain a variogram of by a distance of one, so one lag of 2.8. If you take a second lag, you obtain a distance of, uh, say, a variogram value of 6.38. And then uh, you keep going and you obtain, say, a cloud, that's the stars here, which, yeah, when you take uh, averages and fit, you obtain a line. Um, this example here, one line, is the first line of this two-dimensional uh, data set here. And if instead you take two di directions, or all the directions in, say, the, the data in different directions, you obtain uh, more or less the same variogram once you average it. So this is an example where all the directional variograms in all directions, they overlay. So this is isotropic. It's not necessarily the case. So you can find out if there is an anisotropy in your data by selecting data along different angles. So that's an example of a satellite sea surface temperature data in uh, the North Sea. And you find that there's, uh, say, different variograms in different directions. I'm going a bit fast here. The, uh, this leads us to the next step, which is the Krieging. How to interpret the data once you have explored its structure. Um, Simple Krieging, there's many different ways of doing Krieging. But I'll only show you the simple Krieging because that's the only the one we practice in data simulation. Um, so you have uh, observation points, data points in blue, and one point you want to wish to estimate, your target point x0 in the domain. So you need assumptions to do some Krieging. The assumption is that of second order stationarity. Um, it is the, uh, the assumption that for say um, any translation of your data, the mean remains the same and the spatial covariance remains the same so that you don't have a larger, um, say, uh, um, larger scales to the, to the left and to the right. So if you can assume that, that uh, the, uh, the covariance, whether you're to the left or to the right of your diagram here uh, is the same, then you can go further. 
um, the expectation of the, the uh, random variable has the same value m everywhere. And the, co the covariance between a, uh, any pair of points depends only on the vector h. Uh, that was not smart. I wanted to get rid of the square. But, um, uh -huh. So you only need the separation distance between two points to give the covariance. And that's not, uh, yeah, it's not given by all data sets. So uh, for that, you do an estimator, a simple Krigin estimator. And it is a multiple regression estimator. So you find uh, your estimator with a star here. It is the mean, which is the best thing you can say in the absence of data, plus a weighted average of all the anomalies, all the data points minus the mean. Um, so I'll jump over the, the assumption. Uh, the estimation error is the difference between the estimated Z star and Z, the true value. You have to assume that you know the true value, not that you know it, but uh, that it exists. That's the important difference. It exists, so the difference exists as well. And the mean of this difference should be zero. That's when you, uh, your estimator is unbiased. And if indeed you have the stationary assumption, this, you can express these, uh, say, uh, you can develop the expectation and obtain only m's everywhere. And whatever the sum of these uh, Ways value here, you some m minus m's, you some zeros, that's all zeros. Fair enough. And the errors, they exist, they have a mean, they have as well a variance. And to uh, calculate the variance, well, this is nothing but the expectation of the squares. And the expectation of the squares can be developed. And when you develop it, something interesting happens. You have first, um, you develop the, uh, the, the uh, the expectation, the, um, the estimator as m plus sum of the data. And once uh, the sum of the data um, comes in these cross terms of the expectation, you uh, see the, uh, the expression of the covariance between two points. And since the, um, the, uh, the, the, these uh, covariance can be, uh, say, um, is, um, it can be swapped left and right. You obtain a double sum here of weights times the uh, covariance between the sample points, the covariance of the target point itself, so no sum, just the target point, and the cross covariance between the, um, the, uh, yeah, the, the data points, alphas, and the target points x0 with the weight of the data point. Is two. So um, the estimation variance, the errors of your estimator is expressed in terms of covariance obtained from C of H. You only have Cs in there. So all of this uh, variance estimation only depends on the covariance, which is simulated, which is not simulated, but it's, um, it has a theoretical uh, expression after what we've seen earlier in the diagram. So now uh, that you have an error variance, what you want is the smallest possible error variance. So um, the above um, uh, expression here is a quadratic function of C. And uh, you know it has uh, one uh, zero, one minimum, where all the partial derivatives are zero. So you can take the deriv derivative of this uh, estimation error variance against all of the unknowns, which are the ways of every data point, set them all to zero. That's for all data points, n equations like this. So this gives you these equations, which are, say, if you're patient, you can take the derivative along the w a, w alpha of this equation here, you obtain this one here. This uh, a sum, the remnants of the, the double sum here, minus twice the covariance between the data point alpha and the target point. And that's uh, n equations is the equation system for simple queening. You have n equations and unknowns. You're, you're safe, you can go. You can go with that. So these simple queening equations um, can be uh, written like this, SK for simple queening. The left-hand side 
is the covariance between all the data points. The right hand side is the covariance between data locations and the estimation location, the target point. Um, with covariance computed from C of H, the theoretical covariance, and if you have no duplicate observation, which would break havoc in this uh, matrix, you will have, uh, say, equal lines and equal columns in the, co the covariance in the, 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 the system, there's a unique solution. If you do have duplicate observations, please make them only one. That's fine. So um, the minimum estimation, the simple Krieging. Uh, so the simple Krieging weights can be obtained by uh, inverting this matrix here and solving the, the system. You can as well have the estimation variance from the simple Krieging, which can be obtained by going back to this uh, estimation variance here. Once you have solved one part, this simplifies, simplifies a lot, and you obtain C of zero, the covariance at the target point, minus sum of the weights, the optimal weights from the uh, simple Krieging, times the covariance of the different the um, distance between the target point x0 and all of the data points. Are we doing OK here, or do we have questions? I think we have a, a question. I may have ignored but our example of variables that are transitionally invariant in space. For example, the average temperature in, in, in Bergen is not the same as in Dubai. So here, uh, yes, we are mixing up different notions here. Uh, the, um, uh, yes, the, um, you, uh, uh, yes, you, the temperature of the surface uh, all around, around the Earth is, of course, not a stationary value. It has seasonal variations. There's winters and summers, north and south hemispheres. There's large differences, differences of temperature on average between the tropics and the poles. Even though there's variations, this is far from being stationary. So um, the uh, stationary assumption has limits. And uh, of course, if you want to uh, deal with, uh, say, global surface temperatures, you will need to cut it into smaller domains, into seasons, into um, parts of the problem that can be treated as stationary. But uh, yeah, if you see um, um, someone just pretending, well, I'm taking the uh, temperatures of the uh, surface temperatures all over the globe and running it through one simple, uh, simple Krieging uh, uh, command, uh, you're likely to make a, a big mistake. So the, um, the solution to that is to do the Krieging locally in moving neighborhoods and as well uh, at different times, well, taking the, uh, the time scales that is of interest, say one day, because the day, not even one day, because between day and night, there's as well big changes of temperature. So you have to define a, a subsystem in which the, the assumption is verified. I'm going back to my slide here on simple Krieging. So the simple Krieging has given you new, the optimal weights. And from these optimal weights, you have a, an estimated variance. So next slide is, uh, yes, the, um, the, uh, the system of equations in matrix terms. So we'll have this uh, matrix equation here with the variances on a diagonal and the cross covariances between different points and in the extra diagonal terms, the weights here, and are equal to the right-hand side, which is the covariance between the target point and the data points. Um, this can be noted like this. So you can have a C matrix for the left-hand side, the covariances uh, between data points, C0 between with the, the right-hand side, and your estimator is M plus the weights as a vector, uh, transpose times Z minus the mean, and the Krieging variance is looking at this. So this W uh, vector here is like the, the gain matrix, as you've seen from the, the command filter yesterday. It's, you will see that it is uh, say, looking very similar. I'll come back to that. Um, but essentially, whenever you are uh, inverting a covariance matrix and multiply by a right-hand side like this, you're doing something that is a Krieging, essentially. Simple Krieging in this case. So. With a simple data set, uh, with a, say, I'm not even uh, sure what it is, but you have sample locations here, 
you have data, you're missing a corner in data, you can apply simple krigging, you obtain a map. And you obtain a map of these simple krigging errors. And you will see these simple krigging errors are low, uh, except in the top left corner where you're missing data. And there, the errors are increasing gradually as you're going further away from the last row of points. Right, so uh, there's uh, say, some curiosity about the, uh, the, the um, uh, what happens if you displace the points a little bit. So um, in a nugget effect model, uh, the weights are distributed uh, equally through all the points because it's, uh, there's no structure. So the, uh, the krigging is nothing but the arithmetic average. And so you have here one, uh, say, one krigging estimation variance. Yeah, you can have an estimation variance if you're doing arithmetic average. That's what you know the best. And um, if you use a spherical model, uh, and so the, uh, the points are, uh, have longer spacing uh, left, right, than top, bottom. So the, uh, the points that are closer have more weights than the points that are further off. And you have a smaller uh, Kriging variance if you have a, a, a structure, so structure counts. If you're uh, using a Gaussian model instead of a spherical model, then you're re reducing the um, estimation variance quite a lot from 0 0.84 to 0 0.3. And as well, what happens is that the weight gets very really much on these two nearby points, and you get almost nothing on the, one, the, the points that are the, to the left and to the right, even though, well, then just twice as far. It's not a, it's a high price to pay for a, twice the, the distance. So um, if your diagram is isotropic, you have uh, say equal distribution of the ways. But if you insert some anisotropy in the variogram, a difference between the angles, and you can change that. Uh, if you have only three points instead of four, what's the best way of distributing these points? So if you put them into a, a perfect um, uh, triangle, then you split the way equally between the points. But if you take these two points, and put them left, right instead and have no points to the top, then these get more way um, because of the missing point to the top, but your um, uh, Kriegling variance is a bit higher. So the, the left configuration is a better one if you were doing this sort of observing system experiments. The screen effect is a nice one because that has importance on the, uh, say, this neighborhood where you, where you want to do the, uh, the Kriegling. So if you have a spherical model uh, with a range uh, the, um, uh, half of L, uh, L being this distance here. So the nearby point is getting more weight, but if you insert a point at distance L here, this will get almost the same uh, way as the, the A point to the, to the left. And uh, the, the poor point number B here, which was having 34% of the, uh, the weights, now falls to only 2.7%. So, uh, in technical word, words, it's been screened by the point C here that comes in the middle, uh, which means that you can almost safely discard point B to do your estimation. You can spare a bit of, uh, of uh, computations. That's not working for all covariance models. Uh, for example, if you remember this cardinal sign function that assumes that there's a, a bump and a low and a bump, then these kind of functions and the, the Gaussian function will like to take uh, larger weights for will not have a big screen effect. It would like to take into account the point that is further down um, after. Um, so that's so simple things about uh, Kriging. You have more questions around here. Uh, isn't spherical model almost the same as inverse distance weighing? Well, it's not at all. Um, if you uh, uh, inverse, uh, that's a very good question. Because if you take this uh, configuration here, for example, in the bottom, and you do inverse distance weighing, the inverse distance will give exactly the same way to point A and C. And um, it will give, uh, say, uh, only slighter less weights to point B. But you will not do the same screening. Uh, more, um, if you go back to this point here, you do inverse distance on the, uh, the configuration to the right, then even though the position of the points is not ideal, you still have one third of the way for each of the points. So inverse distance is actually not a Kriging at all. It's, um, it is uh, an, a method for interpolation that is not declustering the data. That is, you can have points that are close to each other, 
the Krieging will be able to split, say, to give appropriate weight to the, the data that is on the, the left-hand side. But uh, inverse distance is not able to do that. So inverse distance will give uh, excessive weight to the points that are clustered together. Right. Thanks for asking. Now, uh, if you go into nonlinear geostatistics, um, so uh, that's uh, where it gets a bit more tricky. Uh, and we have 20 minutes left for this presentation. I'll, I'll take this nonlinear things and then we, uh, we can have a break. Mm -hmm. So, nonlinear geostatistics statistics is, uh, well, first it sounds to pronounce. I have difficulties with that, but that's. Uh, uh, that's something you can overcome. Then it's full of uh, very strange names like this, anamorphosis. It's coming from the Greek, ana, across, morph, shape. So if you, uh, you don't like Greek, you prefer Latin, uh, it has exactly the same meaning as transformation across different forms. So, um, so uh, similar to before, you, you may have, uh, say, uh, data sets, you must have data sets that are not stationary and very rare, very often not Gaussian at all. You can have precipitation uh, instead of temperature. Temperature can be having thing being thought as having Gaussian variations, but precipitation, no, never. And um, what you have is uh, say, uh, a variable that has a given uh, distribution function, and uh, all your theory is based on Gaussian assumptions. It's the Gaussian assumption that has most advantages. You can do uh, estimation, you can do uh, extrapolation into uh, say high dimensions. The Gaussian assumption always gives you an answer. It's, it's a fantastic assumption in that sense that it opens a large box of tools. And if you just uh, strike off the Gaussian assumption, you find yourself in a void of tools and techniques. There's not much you can do if you just deny uh, Gaussianity at all. So one way to get a bit closer to that is to think that you are not too far from being Gaussian. You're just one function away from being Gaussian. So if a y is a standard Gaussian, so normal function, distribution, I mean, and z can be expressed as a strictly increasing function of y, like this, then you already need a good case. Strictly increasing, yes. Uh, strictly increasing, so you have y and you obtain your z values. It could be precipitation, for example. Precipitation can have zero values, but never negative values. Well, unless you count it as evaporation, uh, but uh, that's a different thing. So uh, here is an example of, uh, say, uh, y value that is Gaussian. You see you have plenty of positive, negative values. You have slightly higher values here, but all, of, all in all, if you take the, the histogram of these values, they they come up in a very nicely bell-shaped histogram. Now, if you take, uh, say, the exponential of these values, you find yourself with a field that has mostly small, small, small values and a big lump of very high values there in the bottom left corner. So that's the typical histogram that you will, uh, say, uh, intuitively find as typically non-Gaussian. And that's, say, uh, something that you, you know you'll be in trouble if you treat it as Gaussian because you will obtain values on the left-hand side and the negative side. So transformation, you want to transform something that is not normal into something normal. And that's, uh, you cannot be blamed for that. Um, your uh, sample histogram, you can build it in a cumulative way. You say that you, you don't simply uh, take the histogram like, like this, but every step to the right, you add to the, the values in a previous class. So your histogram is increasing from say zero to the largest value. Then you scale it to one so that it's a distribution, uh, probably see distribution function. It will jump a bit, but it will have an increasing shape. Then that's what you have. And this is what you want to have, uh, the perfect cumulative distribution of a Gaussian distributed function, going from zero at in minus infinity to one at plus infinity. This is beautiful. This is ugly. But you can always match one with the other. The thing is that these are two increasing functions. And um, so if you... Um, take one point to the right and find its equivalent to the left, you have your anamorphosis function. It's nothing more than that. f of x equal g of y, f being the CDF, the cumulative distribution function of the, uh, the two distributions, and you can match them. 
That's it. Now let's go to this change of support. Um, I will have examples of anamorphosis if I come uh, to the end of the uh, second presentation. So um, the thing about the support is that you have, uh, say, uh, observations that are depending on, say, the observation technique. Uh, a thermometer is very small. And um, in the end, if you are, say, uh, simulating the weather, you will never simulate the weather on the scale of a one, uh, say, uh, thumb size thermometer. And that's the same case in mining. In all the, uh, so in mining, it was more, uh, more of a problem because uh, you had volumes being mined. So it's three dimensional. Um, in, if you're uh, talking about soil pollution, you don't care about the third dimension. What you have is a soil surface, but the issue is there. Uh, depending on how your measurements are uh, taken and what you want to simulate, you are dealing with different uh, support, different representativity. And if you have time series of noise pollution, for example, yeah, that's also an issue as well. The time intervals can be smaller or larger. And then that makes a big difference in terms of the variability. So in exploration, in mining, you're drilling a core. That's a size of cubic centimeters. When you're extracting, you're using this kind of, yeah, trucks. Uh, the wheel here is uh, maybe five or six meters high. So the, 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 the driver of this truck is somewhere tiny in there. So that's, you're not considering any volume smaller than a truck because that's not worth processing. Then you have to decide if the truck is going to the processing or to the dump. And uh, that's uh, a decision you have to take for the whole truck. You're not sort of uh, going through the truck and finding, oh, that's maybe here, that's maybe there. No, that's a binary decision taking on a large volume of the, uh, the data of the variable. So the effect of changing the support can be seen in the distribution function. If you're um, taking the small samples of cubic centimeters, they can have a large spread of values from very small values to very large values. But if you take averages in two blocks of cubic meters, then the, the, um, the PDF, the distribution function, is shrinking around its mean. There's a theorem that says the mean remains the same. Yes, you can uh, take uh, a truckload of material and split it into tiny nuggets or tiny uh, stones, and you will have large spread, but you will still have the same mean, because if you average, you have the truck again. So the distribution, distribution of the block values is narrower. The problem with that is if you want to make a decision about this, uh, this truck load, um, you have a certain probability of, um, of having a value that is valuable. And if this probability is on the high side, so if you are dealing with a, say, a material that is very rare, like gold or diamonds, and you, um, you are assessing the, uh, the variance of your truckload of the block, then uh, you should not use the variance from the small samples because that will always lead to an overestimation of the amount. So you, you will send too many trucks to the mill compared to what they actually contain as metal. So that's an overestimation. And um, uh, that's if you're uh, dealing with, uh, say, uh, material that uh, is not very rare, that's, uh, for example, a certain time of, uh, of stones, then um, taking the, uh, the, the, the variance from the, uh, the samples instead of the blocks will lead to an underestimation instead. So if you want to do the job properly, you should incorporate something called a change of support model. And um, there's a case study here uh, in uh, simulations of ozone in the region of Paris. Um, that was in R. I've, I haven't done any uh, proper exercises. If, you, uh, if you're interested to look at it, I can, uh, can get them for you. It, it's all in, in R. And uh, that's a region uh, around Paris with, uh, say, model grid cells of one kilometer and, uh, say, a very ground that has a range of 100 kilometers and ozone-like uh, variables, so they are pollution, a pollutant. So the simulation of ozone on one kilometer grid cells looks like this. And you have, uh, say, a region around Paris, and there's a maximum uh, say, value of ozone that uh, can be dangerous for, uh, for health. And it's only happening at uh, a small area here, but with a very large value of 286. It's far above the norms of, uh, say, normal air quality. But if you start averaging 10 by 10, 
the, uh, the maximum uh, concentration is down to 125. And again, you average again, and uh, the maximum is 87. So if you don't define a special um, support, so a grid size for the norms of air quality, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't have something that is uh, usable in, a, in, a, in a legal enforcement. So the effect on histograms of doing this special averaging, you will lump more the, uh, the values of the histogram if you take larger averages. And um, so the histogram that is looking very much like an exponential to the left will look maybe slightly more Gaussian because of the central limit theorem, but it's still positive valued. You see the, the means are equal, but the variances and extremes are reduced. And if you plot one histogram against the other with a very practical QQ plot, you will see that, yes, the QQ plot fits well on the small values and it starts deviating on the high values. Um, then if you take the variogram of these two, uh, say, av different special averages, the variogram of the one kilometer values is looking this very nice spherical uh, variogram. And uh, the uh, 40 by 40 averages have a smaller variance. So it's the seal is, uh, is getting smaller. And the range increases a bit. It increases by 40, just by the, uh, the, uh, the size of the averaging box. So there's a few references about that, uh, which uh, if you follow the link, you can follow. Um, that brings me to, yeah, still, uh, what was the schedule? Do I still have 10 minutes before the break? Uh, yeah, still have more time before the break. So maybe I can run you through that and then we take a break because the rest will be uh, applications and, uh, and data simulation. So now, if you don't have questions on this so far, the conditional simulations. You've seen that we can uh, explore the data, you obtain a variogram, you can interpolate the data, you have a Kriging. The Kriging has a standard deviation of estimation. That's something that you, you may want to use, um, especially if you're dealing with, uh, say, extremes and uh, uh, values above or below a given threshold. But uh, what brings us towards the data simulation is the ability to do conditional simulation. That is, uh, to do something that is not uh, an interpolation, but will fill all the values and will look like the truth. Um, so that's, um, I will come with these uh, definitions, a geostatistical simulation, and what's a, a Gaussian conditional simulation. So the stochastic simulations, these with the generation of a, a com on a computer, of course, you're not doing that by hand, of certain numbers quantities that look random. It must have the appearance of randomness, but it's not only the appearance of randomness, it should also have true randomness. And uh, there's statistical criteria that you can use to decide if this is random or if it's actually not truly random. So there's something, um, something not religious, religious but uh, something uh, a bit mystical about what is randomness. Um, in geostatistics, there's uh, different categories of problems. When you have uh, continuous variables with, uh, say, the variables that we know mostly in data simulation, they are defined on a region. They have values on, uh, say, between minus infinity and plus infinity. So it's uh, thickness of a geological layer, velocity of sound, continuous variables. You can rank them and uh, you can add, multiply, and that will make sense. But there's other variables that you are falling outside of these categories. Uh, categories, for example, when you classify soil types, and that's land, that's potatoes, and this is rocks. You cannot do any kind of classification that of, you, know, you can classify, but you cannot um, add, multiply, or do anything like this. And then there's objects, uh, which is very useful in geology. Um, when you want to have fractures, and these fractures uh, can be simulated as, uh, say, geometrical objects, lines, and um, a reservoir of oil can be seen as, a, say, a sphere in a, or a, a given uh, shape. So, but we're looking only at the first category with, a, say, random functions uh, that are conditioned on data. So, I'll come back to that. Um, if you wanted to predict uh, a value, then the uh, the method is Kriging, and to do Kriging, you wanted you need a variogram model. Now, uh, maybe predicting 
say one value and it's an deviation is not what you want. You may want to do more advanced uh, calculations and that requires ensembles of realizations of a random function. So you can do that by conditional simulation and you need a model of the spatial distribution. So the, uh, the, uh, the PDF of the, the, of the whole spatial distribution. So conditional simulations is simulations that match the data at the data location. They're not strictly random. And to do the conditioning, so to make sure that this uh, simulation will be random, but will still match the data, you can do that with simple Kriging. You're back to the same tools. So uh, in pictures, but in words, um, so you have a simulation to the left, which uh, for us is the truth. You can extract samples uh, to the right. They have values. You can, um, well, study these values, get the variogram, interpret the values, have a Kriging to the left, and the Kriging will look nothing like the simulation. Uh, it will match the, the samples because you will see that you will have high and low values around the samples, but it will not have the same appearance. Uh, to the right, what you want to have is a conditional simulation that both has the roughness and the look and feel of the simulation, and that's well matches the observations where there is observations. Um, so the, um, the, the Gaussian simulation, non-conditional, has the right, the right roughness. You can do that with a, a, um, a variogram. They reproduce the variogram and histogram of the data. The Kriging is an average of simulation. It's an expectation. So it is, by construction, smoother than reality. The Kriging is a linear estimator, so that's appropriate for uh, all the quantities that are linearly related to the, the data. So uh, the mean, the uh, say any kind of regression of uh, your variable is uh, is still okay with a uh, if you have only have the, uh, the the expectation. But if you want to do statistics uh, on on samples of realization, um, that's that can give you say uh, say nonlinear estimates like the probability of being above above a threshold or other kind of statistics skewness kurtosis. Um, so an example that is uh, well done of very say up to date technology uh, that's a paper from 1979 and you can uh, discover here how uh, graphics in uh, in geostatistical uh, literature were looking like in 79. Uh, the problem is to lay a submarine cable on the ground of the ocean. So you have done a survey, you've done your job correctly, and at every uh, 100 meters, you've taken the depths of the ocean. And then uh, one thing you can do is just uh, do a Kriging. You interpolate between the depths that you have measured, and uh, say with a, a linear uh, type of uh, variogram, you obtain this uh, linear interpolation between the, the, the points. That's, uh, say, uh, very valid uh, Kriging uh, result. Measure the length of the line here, you obtain 945 meters. And you set off to see on your ship, you deploy the cable with 945 uh, meters of cable. And then you find yourself too short. Uh, that's because the actual length is always uh, different, always larger than the, uh, the, uh, the results you've obtained by Kriging because of the small scales that were not uh, there measured in your, in your sample of data. So an alternative to Kriging is to uh, have a conditional simulation, something that will not be perfect. It will not be the truth at every point of the ocean. You will spare uh, sampling the ocean every meter. You can still use every 100 meters, but you can simulate randomly uh, the variations between the, the samples. So that's an example of conditional simulation. And uh, so you see that it matches the points where you have observations, it diverges in the mean in between, but still that's not important. The important is that the actual length is comparable to the true length. So you have a, a simulated profile of 1154 meters, and that's more or less, uh, it's not too far from the, the true length. Could have been a value above, could have been a value slightly below. The point is here is to avoid any bias. So uh, geostatistics has a very large part of this uh, literature on unconditional Gaussian simulations, how to simulate fields that are, um, that are correlated in space. 
And uh, that's a fantastic literature. It's full of geometry and uh, random objects being just random leaves falling on top of each other. And uh, uh, I'm not going to go through that. It will take us too much time. Uh, I will just assume that whether the method is called turning bands it, or if it's spectral using Fourier transforms or diffusion equations, you have the ability to simulate a random field that has a given variogram. That's all I want you to assume. And uh, that's this. Um, for most variograms, there's at least three or four different techniques, more or less costly, for doing that. So now let's look at how to condition the Gaussian simulations by the Kriging. Simple Kriging, as I said earlier, that's the, the chief tool in, um, in data simulation. So you have your samples and uh, you have a target location X0, as we've seen earlier. And um, we have a Gaussian random function y of x that is known at the sample locations only. And the first thing you'll do is Kriging. Yes, because you know how to do Kriging. So you can have, um, uh, say, uh, you can compute the, the, the Kriging estimator at every point of your domain. What you have is uh, something you know exists, but you don't have at hand, which is a true value at your target point. You have the value of the Kriging, the estimator, and you know that there's a Kriging error, something which is an error. It's unknown, but you will try to simulate that randomly. So uh, the same quality can be used for simulated values. You have done unconditional simulations, so they're noted S here, just simulations. And uh, they um, can be split as well as uh, the sum of the Kriging value of this uh, unconditional simulation and the error of Kriging. The difference being that this time you have simulated your data, so you know uh, this error here. So um, um, what you will do from now is construct a bridge between the two. So there's a conditional simulation that will use the Kriging from the actual data and the simulated Kriging error from the non-conditional simulations. So you will have interpolated your conditional simulation just to calculate the errors here. And then you just throw away the Kriging of the simulation. So Kriging is an exact interpolator. If you take the Kriging value at the point of your simulation, you will have exactly your observation value. This means this in this equation, at the data point x alpha, the estimator is the true value. The simulation at the observation point is the true simulation because it's your simulation, it's the Kriging. So your conditional simulation, by virtue of what is written above, will have the value of your observation. That's fine. It interpolates the data exactly. If the location is far away from the data, so um, in the case where the Kriging uh, cannot really do any, uh, any good because it is uh, only returning the, uh, the, the mean value, which is zero in simple Kriging, then your conditional simulation will turn to the simulated, the unconditional simulation without any impact from the, the Kriging. Okay, that's the other extreme case. But in between, you will have something else. So here, <clears throat> in graphics here, you have this unconditional simulation, which has the right the amount of roughness, the right scales, but doesn't match the data. You take uh, the, the anomalies from the uh, Kriege value of the unconditional simulation. As I said earlier, they're not uh, depending at all on the data. So the, the Kriging of these values will not match data either. But the difference between the two is the uh, simulated Kriging error. Then you have taken the Kriging of your observations. They match data. You add that to the errors, and you obtain conditional simulations that are uh, have the right roughness. They're random, and they match the observations. So that's what a conditional simulation is. It is, say, in poetical words, um, I don't I forgot the name of the author. It's a lie that always tells the truth. So you can generate as many as you want of these. They will be exact at the point of the uh, observations. And if you're very far from your, these points, they will be taking just random values, but with the right roughness and the right properties, statistically speaking. Now, if you try to connect that to what we had from the uh, ensemble common filter yesterday, so. Uh, um, copy the slide. I don't know if uh, Gear showed the same slide yesterday or maybe a modified version of that. You had um, 
the analysis equation of the answer Markman filter. It's the, uh, say, analysis is the forecast plus this Kalman gain times the innovation here, difference between observations and the model at the observation locations. And that can be written more shortly like this. And uh, how is that connected to the uh, uh, condition and simulation algorithm we've seen before? You can start to reshuffle the terms here. So um, you take the difference between the um, analysis and the forecast. So you take this XF and put it on the, uh, the left-hand side. What you obtain is, um, uh, wait a minute, that's not what I've written here. So um, if you update the mean, uh, you obtain, say, uh, the anomaly is uh, I minus KH times the, the forecast plus K times the data. Uh, actually, that's not what uh, I wanted to show. Uh, I want to, us to concentrate on that part here above and try to, um, to find out where are the terms of this thing here, the conditional simulations. So um, your un unconditional simulation is uh, the forecast uh, here. It has, uh, say, um, um, I'm getting confused here. Um, the, um, the, the, I should have rehearsed this one. So um, what you are having uh, in the ensemble kind of filter, if you only um, think of the, uh, the unconditional forecast, which is the forecast from your model, the, uh, the numerical model, you add a term here, K, which is a Kriging. So that uh, has all the ingredients we've seen before. It is inverting a matrix that's expressed between the observation points and multiplied to a matrix between observation points and your target point, which is the X uh, scalar here. And you have the observations that are um, interpolated because this operation here is a Kriging. And uh, you may wonder where is the Kriging of the simulated observations? It's where you have the observation errors because the observation errors uh, can be simulated as well. That's uh, the part where you when you use the um, uh, the perturbed obs uh, ensemble kind of filter, and then going through the Kriging as well. And there, yeah, they um, they are contributing to the variance of the analysis. So. Uh, Maybe that was not a very good explanation, uh, but you can uh, identify the conditional simulation to uh, the, uh, the uh, update of every member of the ensemble kind of filter. So the um, conditional expectation and the, and the variance. So I don't know if you are familiar with the, uh, this um, uh, concept of the conditional uh, expectation. Um, if uh, you want to uh, express the fact that the, the mean of the conditional simulation is the Kriging, you take the expectation of conditional simulation at uh, the, um, the sample points, and they're equal to the Kriging estimator. So uh, that's, say, more mathematical terms. And the variance of the conditional simulation, so say you have been taking a large number of conditional simulations, hundreds and thousands, calculate the variance, and they will be equal to the Kriging standard deviation. So you're falling back on your feet by having uh, the, uh, say, conditional simulations instead of Kriging. Where the conditional simulations become much more, uh, say, powerful is that you can take, uh, uh, you can look back to this idea of the anamorphosis that um, uh, you would not uh, do Kriging uh, simply on variables that are not, uh, say, Gaussian distributed. But if you calculate uh, conditional simulations of the Gaussian variable and then transform them one by one, you can obtain conditional simulations of the, uh, the non-Gaussian data. So um, simulating the non-Gaussian data, that's what's happening here. Uh, you fit an anamorphosis function here. So you need to uh, find out the, the CDF of Z and match the CDF of the perfect Gaussian and then you obtain your uh, phi function here. You transform your observations to Gaussian value. That's your observations. They just become Gaussian now. You fit the variogram. It's important to fit the variogram on the Gaussian va values 
uh, rather than the non-Gaussian values because the non-Gaussianities tend to distort the variogram. So it's, uh, it's more stable to calculate a variogram, which is a second order expectation thing, um, if your values are, are Gaussian. Then you simulate the realizations, y of uh, uh, x, with, uh, say, the non-conditional simulations. You uh, do the conditioning using Krieging, as I said before, and obtain a conditional simulation of y. And then the only part that is left is to transform back your uh, Gaussian conditional simulation to the non-Gaussian uh, values. And there you are. You have uh, obtained, say, uh, a number of samples of um, conditional simulations of your z value. They respect the, observ the observations. You can find out that uh, they are, that's, uh, that's respected. And they will have the correct uh, spatial features. And you, you can now start calculating the mean, the variance of z without having afterthoughts, because you can do that on a large number of, uh, of members of uh, say, conditional simulations. A few references here. So a book by Chiles and a book by Christian Jean Tujoul, who are, uh, the, these books will give you all you need to know about uh, these uh, conditional simulations and uh, the, the old geostatistical techniques and more, much more than that. That ends uh, this presentation. And I think it's time for a, a good, good coffee break. And um, we'll still have two, three minutes. I haven't looked at uh, HackMD so far. Uh, maybe there's a uh, question there. Uh, there haven't been um, an extra question other than one of my comments. And okay. uh, I have moved uh, questions from the chat to the HackMD too. Yeah. OK. So uh, let me move this Zoom windows so that I can read. Um, Yes. So uh, your question about uh, um, yeah the the, the, the vocabulary here about optimal interpolation, optimal interpolation or what the uh, say very early Russian uh, methodologists called objective analysis is Krieging. Uh, it is the same techniques. It is inverting a matrix, multiply on right hand side by the uh, uh, with the target point. So this is all different names for the same thing. Um, yes. Depending uh, on the literature, I, you'll find more or less advanced versions of Krieging done in uh, say, optimal interpolation. So I want to point out one thing that uh, you showed the uh, Geyer's uh, slide yesterday the, that says ensemble method. So if you compare that to Krieging, it's additional flow dependent covariance will, will be totally mm -hmm. different. So we want to point that out too. Yes. Uh, as I said, the um, geostatistics is what you do when your model is so bad that you cannot do anything with it. So um, um, uh, in a uh, Kalman filter or uh, of course here in an ensemble Kalman filter, uh, the, um, the, um, the covariance function will be obtained not by say fitting a variogram. Uh, you realize that you, you practice data simulation without fitting a variogram every time you want to have your uh, 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 do an analysis. Uh, it's the model uh, ensemble that will provide the, uh, the special covariances. So in that, you have to trust that the model scales are the right scales, special scales, instead of that uh, uh, the, um, the covariance uh, obtained between data points will be the same as you would have to obtain um, if it were the true scales. And uh, the advantage of uh, using a model and uh, some kind of filter is that you obtain very easily um, multivariate covariances. That is the covariances between the observed variables and the not observed, non-observed variables. So uh, that uh, say opens a, say a brand new world of uh, things you can do with an ensemble kind of filter that um, say cannot be done obviously uh, with a, with a simple uh, geostatistical tool. So uh, there are tools that are multivariate in Krieging. You have something called um, co-Krieging, so having observations of different observations of different variables at different place. There's methods that uh, handle that optimally. But um, in, uh, say in terms of data simulation, the, uh, the using a, a numerical model offers you many more possibilities. I have now a few more questions in the chat uh, yes. from Claire Lauverne. Uh, the difference with Gaussian processes. So, um, um, 
uh, Gaussian processes is not the kind of literature I'm very used to, but uh, I believe it is the same, uh, that a Gaussian process is a random variable that can be uh, expressed as, say, uh, a simple combination of, uh, say, random functions. So in the first uh, example, I was showing the time series of red noise. Um, it is simple to generate um, the, the, uh, the time series. You can generate random numbers and then uh, add them with a given weight to the previous uh, realization of the random number, and you go on. That's how you go from white noise to red noise. You just add up and um, with a, say, a, a sum of ways uh, uh, that uh, respect some conditions. But uh, that is, uh, say, uh, a simple way of doing uh, Gaussian processes. And uh, Gaussian processes are much more general because you can have them in, uh, say, uh, in any dimensions. And, um, but uh, say, you can combine, uh, say, uh, you can easily see uh, the correspondence between time series analysis with uh, ARMA and ARIMA models, so autoregressive models with uh, averaging models. And, and Gaussian processes. They are in, uh, say, instead of being in one dimension, they are in several dimensions. Um, okay. So, second, sorry. Was that... Thank you. Oh, welcome. Uh, second one from uh, Kyung Book Lee, sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, explain the Cridge unconditional simulation, page 91. What is the difference between unconditional simulation and Cridge unconditional simulation? Um, Yes, that's a tricky one. Um, because um, am I still sharing my presentation? So many things on my screen now that. Uh, yeah, we can still see the PDF file. Okay. Um, is it at the right page? The one with the, let me see, view, slideshow. So, so that's right. Uh, you have the. Um, unconditional simulation, which is uh, any random simulation that only has the right roughness. Uh, it, um, it does not have any knowledge of the data. But if you pretend that um, the values at the observation points are, uh, say, observations, you can select them, disregard the rest of the, the uh, unconditional fields, and apply the Kriging estimator. So you will uh, apply the, um, the operations I've shown earlier. So I'll jump back to uh, where we were. You can go. You can apply the, um, yeah, this Kriging operator here. So um, the covariances will be the same covariances as you uh, have used for the true data. Um, so they only depend on the spacing between the data points. But the, the difference will be that uh, the, um, um, you would apply uh, the, uh, seem to be the right one here. You would um, apply this equation here, the Kriging equation, not to the data, but replace instead to the unconditional simulation uh, extracted at the locations where you have observations. So here, instead of z of xa, you would uh, take z s simulated at xa. And that's the Kriging of the unconditional simulation. In itself, it has no value. It is purely random simulations just taken out, out of a say, simulation algorithm at the places where you have observations. So they're not telling you anything about your true field, but you will need to calculate that to obtain the uh, estimation error. And then this estimation error is added to the Kriging of the true data this time. So, um, the Kriging of the true data in replacement of the Kriging of the unconditional simulation. And that will simulate the Kriging error. And yeah, 
give you a conditional simulation instead. One more, thanks. And how does the change of support in Geo36 connect to the concept of representation errors in data simulation? It is the same concept. Um, the representation error in data simulation is slightly more com complex because there's a point about uh, the, um, the model representation. So, um, but in a sense, uh, you have differences between uh, the, uh, the footprint of a satellite or the size of a thermometer and the grid cell uh, that's where you, that is your target point in uh, data simulation. So there is the, um, the additional uh, complication is to know whether one grid cell in the model is actually representing itself or if it's representing a slightly larger footprint. And that's uh, a point that is, uh, say, um, uh, is actually quite important in uh, ocean modeling, for example, because an ocean model cannot resolve uh, scales that are uh, smaller than four or eight times um, the size of the grid cell. So if you simply consider that the grid cell is the support or is the representativity of your model values, you're underestimating it. The errors that you have in the ocean, ocean model are much larger, at least four times larger than the, the grid cell size because of the numerical schemes used in the model. They uh, say they tend to smooth the solution. They take averages of values that are uh, on a given stencil. So just like uh, satellite images uh, can be smoother than uh, the actual resolution because a satellite may have a very, say, uh, complex footprint with lobes and uh, say, it can observe uh, not say just a pixel of reality, but a convolution function uh, of, re of, the, uh, of reality. So therefore, when you uh, say consider the resolution of a satellite image, uh, the square uh, size of the pixel size is just a simplification of uh, a complex uh, footprint of a satellite. So that um, in reality, the re representation is, is, is not exactly the grid cell size. And first order approximation, it is the same because right, people tend to give uh, satellite data on a grid that makes sense, that uh, is not too far from the uh, true uh, satellite resolution. Okay, I think uh, we can uh, have a coffee break for now and come back at uh, 10 past 11, and I will give you some, uh, say, some examples of, uh, of the Topaz system.